I'm just trying to grab a few hours fishing, trying to catch a catfish. And I'll lose one. Join me in this episode and see how it pans out. guys have got a really good swim here but obviously I'm fishing here casting to the right so it's sort of tight if anybody else fishes here and I fished here once with Mike and there were no lilies they were all on the uh, the roots were I had died back over there and they were all in amongst the dead roots in the winter I can see a float over the back there so somebody's been float fishing for them as well but this would be a good spot for cats I'm sure it's full of them under there but it's getting them out is, uh, is the problem. Even tied to any other swim over that side. And that's presumably where that orange float is over there. You can just see. That's quite an open area here. If you hook a fish near the least, you've got a chance of getting it out. This is a corner swim. There's a rat just went down there. The river's got this swim, good luck. You've got the bubbler blowing there. So you've got a nice channel along here, but again, really, really tight there for getting the fish out. A small fish move there, look, see, that's what they're gonna take. So that's why I chose this swim, to be honest, it's gonna be a bit of space. So I'm putting my little bait stuff of a piece of twig on there. See, I can't, my problem before, I've been losing fish, was I'm trying to get you guys the actual hook up start to fish. It can't happen with catfish because they're burying in the rushes, they're going around the island, they're halfway up the M4. You can't mess around with catfish. They're just gone. You can't give them an inch is what I'm, I'm saying. I'll go through crossways like this. So that fish I actually hooked and was fighting for some time before I even got it close enough to get to the camera. I was not taking any chances whatsoever. Then I got my hook here. And I'm just going to hook that around there with a half hitch and any other knot that I can invent at the time. Just, just go round it. I just think, I think I mentioned it before that. Hands are shaking. <laughs> That's it, two knots. Just hanging like that. Snip the tag end off. Put it in your box. Don't sit on the rod ground. Look what I just did to the rod, guys. Look, look, isn't that sad? I've had the first fish I've had on this rod, brand new. Not new, new to me. Okay. Let's straighten that kink out. What the hell's happened there? Let's see if I can drop it over that same corner by running really dangerously close to those lilies. Oh, no, that didn't go. But you've got to be in it to win it, guys. Now I've noticed there's a lot of weed here. So I'm trying not to bump it or anything like that, not to move it, you know. So it's locked up there, now I've gone on to back wind.
You can see the bow in the line entering the water there. I just want to come tight to it there. That's all I want. I tighten up on the spool here, which brings a bobbin just up there. Perfect. Now I can make my other rig up. Well, that's working at the Totally Awesome Fishing Show. I am at Finch Farm on the Catfish Lake with my two new rods. Second hand rods I bought for £30 off a of Mick here. Big reel, yeah, medium sized reel, but it's actually a two speed one, which I haven't really used a great deal. Mad fish two speed. You just drop the speed on it there for winding. And um, a regular old interceptor. Is that an Akuma over there? Carp rod. These two new mega carp rods. Look at the size of the butt rings on those guys. Even I can thread something through there. And the tip ring, what a luxury. The tip ring's bigger than the butt ring on that one. Well, you've got to catch something there, haven't I? I'm on lunch and meat. I've taken the two fixed bobbins off at the front and I put my washing up top bottle tops there. I just feel that you can, they hang in a bit of V. I don't, I'm not really a great lover of those chain ones with the, you know, carpy warpy ones. I'm not really a great lover of them. They're all right for night fish for carp when they hook themselves bolt rigging, but I'm not, I'm free lining. I have just one shot on there, a triple A shot, that's the only weight I've got, so the lunch of meat's just sitting down there. And I, I used to tighten up quite a, a lot, and I used to like bumping the, the meat across the bottom, thinking it leaves a little trail. I think now I might put it into the silt that's down there. So now I just cast out, let it sit, go go to the sea, seabed? Where'd the seabed go? Go to the seabed, go to the lake bed. It's because I'm going hopefully shark fishing next week. <laughs> it's in my head, the shark fishing. Drops down to the lake bed and just sits there. And then I just tighten up slowly and put the bobbin and, you know, slack part in there. So it's only got to move two, not even barely three feet before it uh, comes tight on the reel. The reels are on back wine, guys. So should I look away? Should I be filming and miss something? I don't like using catfish with a bait when I just don't like it. It's all right with carp but I feel they can come up against it and they blow it out a lot of the time anyway, so fingers crossed we get a take. I've got a take, oh, is that? I'm not doing a cook-up. Don't like these crisps, I think they're fat-free or something like that. And it's, it must be the fat that makes them taste. I know it's not good for you, I know it's not good, but it does at least give it a bit of taste. These are fairly bland, these would be like eating pieces of cardboard that you cut up. Healthy bread by the look of it. One beat, that's probably win. Well, right, I'm going to have a sandwich, guys. I'll get back to you if I do have a hook-up. And I might not switch the camera on straight away. Oh, two beats, that's interesting. I might not switch the camera on straight away because I've lost so many fish, especially catfish, messing around, trying to get the camera on. They just, if you let their heads turn, they're away. And some big cats in there, ones you can't stop. Right, enjoy. The other thing is where you sit. You can see where I'm sitting here. If you sit too far down here and you get a drop back bite, when you go to strike, you're just pulling up the slack. Does that make sense? You pull up the slack, whereas this way, I'm balanced between a fish pulling that way, I can pull into it, but also a drop back. I can st strike back here and still take up that slack. So it's quite important, actually, the distance you want to sit, you know, from a rod. You think, I'm going to go out and take two paces forward to try and get to the rod and then set the hook. But they might be bumping it towards you, might they? They might not always pull the opposite direction, especially catfish, you don't know which way they're going. Just a little tip anyway, you know, try and get yourself balanced about right. I can reach down there, can't I? I've only got to stand up to get that one. I don't like that weed there. I've got a feeling they might come on that channel between the lilies and the rushes, but it's very, very tight to drop on. There, that's good to me. Boy, I've really got to hang on if I do hook a fish here. So I'll just tweak that line to sink it like this. Then I'm only going to move the rod, open the bait arm, back the line off, so I'm not dragging that bait into the mud. Just want it just sitting there. Bobbing on. Got a feeling 
these bobbins are going to come flying through this butt ring. So you just let the just let the weight of the the bobbin just just tension the line there, and then I wind it up a little bit. I don't want a long drop over there and that swing because that's a that's a hit and hold territory. That one, so it's still dropping down. Am I on back wind? Yeah. I think I'll recast this one while I'm at it. Wow, that one's on the money. That is right on the corner of the lilies, the rushes. They might actually come around the rushes, to be honest, around the edges. Finally, I think I'm going to chuck this one a little bit further up. And that there is the gear shift where I can go from high speed to low speed on the reel there. Two speed reel and it's got like a bait runner attachment to it as well. So, that's just a sort of different reel. Don't get to use it too much. Quite like the, uh, the long handle and I like that ergonomic design there. Some of them have a big ball to it, especially the sea fishing ones. I don't really like those. I don't like the big, big ball on them. The other one here, the other one there, just the old interceptor. It's just tried and trusted. I've no idea how long they last, but it's quite an old reel. And this one's a Biomaster that would be, um, well, 35 years old, at least. And the gear on that's really low gearing on that one quite handy when you're trying to power on, put power on a fish as well. Well, we're all reloaded, hopefully, up there. We're not going to get any rain coming in because I have no brolly. It is 10 past three. It'd be nice to get a fish. Nice to get a take. Well, boys, nothing else of consequence. I should have bought my um, umbrella. Uh, as you can see, I tried to put the put the weight bag, everything up there, just to try and give me a bit of a windbreak. It's only the air that's moving. It's windy out there. The rush is here. They're a real good screen. I've seen loads of bubbles come up, but I've had this before, and I've tried dropping lunch of me right on the bubbles. Nothing. I'm not sure they're not just bream or something like that, to be honest. But uh, nothing taken yet. But gentleman over the bivy over there is. I think it's happy hour every hour because he's he's got so much cannabis going there that uh, oh, I can smell it. It's a, it's like a forest fire. It's like they're burning the forest of Brazil over there. So he's having a good time anyway. Nothing here though, and it's chilly. So I've got the I've got the hoodie up. Anything to keep it little bit of air temperature but my fault I should have bought a body warmer that's all I needed and my small fishing umbrella I bought Mike's bag not mine so it sort of came across half cocked and there was actually a, a dead fish I saw it dying flipping around out there a little roach like this so what I've done is um, when he came in upside down to let the wind bring him in I netted him out I've put him on top of the luncheon meat I put him on the hook so it looks like he's feeding on the luncheon meat and then lobbed it round by the lilies whether anything had taken it I don't know but I've never fished with a fish bait and luncheon meat on the same hook so we'll see what happens guys I'm on I've been fighting the fish for a bit trying to keep away from the lilies that was on That was on the uh, combo bait. There 
you're going to get more of that iron. Sort it out in a minute. It's going to be tangled time. Wow, a bit of pressure on him. Look at those rushes. See if I can hold him back a bit. I'm going to take a bit of sorting out if I get him this close. Digging in for the bottom, this one. Oh, I've done it. It's got to be a double figure fish the way it's going. Come on, man. Take your time, take your time. It's a mess, but it's a, oh, this could be a good one. The trouble is the more I drag it around tangled up my lines, the more chance that hook's got off. On the other rods I get off tangling in something. I've got a lot of pressure on him. A lot of pressure on him. Oh yeah, he's a big fish by the look of it. Strange little fight, I have to say. Oh, that's a big one. Big one, boy. <sighs> He's in. <sighs> that was... Absolute ball bust up a fight, if pardon my French. And that was on a combo bait. It was a cube of luncheon meat with a uh, dead roach hooked on as well. See what he goes. It's definitely double figures. Oh, I'd say pretty much around the same. 16. 16, two boys. Oh, wow, result. Well, I'll try and get him up for you, if I can. About as good as I can get. There we go. 16-2. What a beaut. What a fight. And what a mess I got sorted out by the lines. I was lucky to get that one in, boys. Wowie. Cracker chat. Look at the mouth on that. It makes me wonder, you know, should be using more combo baits. We use combo baits when we're sea fishing, don't we? But there, that's a beauty. Let's get him back. Here he is. I must make sure I don't get the old camera wet. Look at that. Wow, that was what I call a serious result. And do you know, I think that's the first catfish I've caught on a combo bait. So it's got me thinking now. <sighs> it's a bit like a bomb site. Who cares? Happy days. Or is it that happy backy? It's that happy backy coming over here. 
stinks. Well, thank goodness I ended up with a fish in the net. I was grateful for that. Now, don't go away. There's some good tips coming up from Alex, who runs Saxon Mill Fishery on the Warwickshire Avon. One is about... Check it out. The other part of it is, I find, really interesting for anybody who goes night fishing. And listen, you beach fishermen out there, you might want to think about this one. Well guys, I'm all packed up at the moment. I'm ready to go jungle fishing. But I'm here with Alex who runs the fishery and I'm gobsmacked by the size. I don't know if you're going to see it in there. It's just the biggest Godzilla of a bed you've ever seen. So what's the story behind that, Alex? Uh, yeah, so that's a, a Nash Emperor bedchair. Uh, unfortunately, I'm a bit of a portly fella, and uh, I like the extra support he gets. It's nice, it's comfier than most of my beds at home. So one thing that I have done is replaced all of the bungee elastics with a 100 pound breaking strain. Uh, uh, these are zip ties, so you can get them from, you know, any really good electrician's place or any, any good housing depot place or anything like that. Um, but what it does is it lightens up the bed chair as well as gives you a bunch of extra support. So I've got a bad back, it came off a motorbike when I was a kid. And um, I've always found that they sag over time once you've, you know, once you've been battering them on the bank for a few years. Um, whereas this, it firms everything up, keeps you nice and level when you're sleeping. So um, yeah, it stops you from uh, getting a bad back. And this, as I say, I sleep better than I do at home when I'm out on the bank. It's, uh, it really is a great way to uh, sort of bring a bit of new life into a bed chair. So this is a Bivy power bank. Um, it's a homemade one. Um, it lasts anywhere between two to three weeks if you're just charging phones, vapes and cameras and things like it's that. A is it a bait bucket? You've made yeah, it's just a bait bucket and inside of which um, is just a couple of mobility scooter batteries. Can we have um, a look at that? You can have a quick look at yeah, that Yeah, of course, it's a bloody mess in there. Um, but all I've done is just pack it out with insulation foam just so nothing rattles around. Oh, it's a bit of a messy moving. job, I'm by no means an electrician. Um, and then just so I can get to the terminals to charge it, a bit of cut up toilet roll tube, wow. just so the insulation oh, foam yeah. doesn't get around all the terminals. So you can just put your crocodile clips on there yeah. and charge it up. And inside of there is two 17 amp hour batteries, just standard 12 volt lead acid batteries. Uh, you don't need lithium or anything too powerful, they do the job. Onto that then is a uh, marine panel. Uh, you can get these off um, various places like Amazon and eBay for about 15, 16 pounds. And they come fully loaded, already wired up, ready to go with um, what would be a cigarette charger. Oh, so you can charge yeah, yeah. Uh, well any 12 volt devices. And then it also comes with a couple of USBs with quick charge. So you know they'll, they'll charge a, a, a Samsung or an iPhone up in around about 45 minutes. And what's Little the volt meter? Oh, it's a volt meter, is it? Yeah, just so you can keep an eye on your charge. You know, you do need to know roughly. You know, about 13 and a half volts is full. Anything below 12 is getting on its way out. So uh, you you can run proper lights on that, can't you? Really? Yeah, LEDs yeah. Well, there's stuff. a couple of LEDs on here just because I like to have a little bit of ground lighting. So in the night. So that's what they're for. They're not charging. No, no, no. These uh, are literally just, 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 just to show me at night where my shoes are, where everything is on the ground, without having to blind my swim or anybody else with a head torch or anything like that. Now I heard you mention before we uh, rigged up to uh, bed in for the night as it were, that, that's a separate bivvies by the way. <laughs> <I'll rephrase laughs> that's that room one. for two. <laughs> yeah, that's right, there is on that one. Yeah, you mentioned about putting like an isotope on the, over the real handle. Yeah, so one thing I've always noticed, I haven't got them on these rods, these are my Nash entities, but there's always a slight channel on the inside of Fuji real seats. You do get it with other real seats as well. Yeah. There's a slight channel there and it's a great place just to super glue an isotope in. That way, if you do want to keep really stealthy, if you've got multiple fish in the swim, you don't want to blast the water with a head torch, you can just mount a little super glue and isotope in there. And, and you then find straight it away, easy, can't you? You know, well, more importantly, you know exactly where your real handle is. You can yeah. just find it, grab it, and you're on there. None of this fumbling, fumbling. around, trying to find the clutch, trying to find where yeah. your bait runners are. It's just lit up nicely and you can just pounce on the rods but stay completely in the dark and then you can use you know the red light on your bivvy if you don't want to spook out the rest of your swim i found that to be pretty deadly actually fishing low light especially on rivers they don't like it when there's a big beam of light in the water it disturbs their feeding again and then um well they just don't come back thanks to alex for those tips anyway back outside now in the garage and again something you might not have thought of doing but i'll tell you what it's worthwhile just make the effort to tidy things up before the next fishing trip. Well, people, I'm just back from, as you can see, boy, it stinks, absolutely stinks. A mega fishing trip. I opened the garage door, so the last job I did, OMG. For those of you who have followed my various, often winter projects of pallet builds, pallet cabins, pallet coffee tables, whatever, and junk and general stuff, look at this garage. You could park a Rolls Royce in here. Well, you wouldn't, because I'm going to fill it out with wooden junk again. I've painted it all out 
with that uh, garage floor paint. I've been meaning to do it, I haven't done it for about three years. So I am absolutely pristine. It looks perfect. Unfortunately, it doesn't look perfect in a totally awesome workshop. The rods are just junked. Everything's junked. It's like a bomb cycle. <laughs> I just wanted to paint the floor before I went fishing. But well worth doing. Now, one of the things when you unpack, I think it's worth telling people, look, just wash your gear like you, did I say that? Just wash your, all your stuff that's been associated with fish slime. Because my car, I left it in there last night because I did an afternoon session, a full night session, I got two hours sleep because I had so many car. And then a day session at another lake, so I was cream cracking and went to bed about nine o'clock last night. But in the morning, I've got to unload all this, sort through it. Just get out. The old baby changing mats, your waist slings, your bags, the small way mats, everything, your net. Look, I just get some flash, or you can get washing up liquid or even disinfectant if you wanted. And just, if you've got a sunny day, wash it all off, that's drying. It helps stop the spread of any fish disease and it makes the stuff smell, I won't say sweeter, I won't say, no, no, let's, let's not draw the line, be too stupid. But you know what I mean? Just get this stuff, one, it's a sunny day, wash it all out because, let's face it, you don't know when you're going to go fishing again, do you, you know? So just a little tip there. Now, what to do next? There's always what to do next with me. So talking about the last thing I made out of pallet wood here was literally a few days ago for Mike's, one of, well, one of the bushcraft shows he's, he's done for his coffee display. In case you didn't know it, my son markets his own range of coffee. And I've made, made this out of pallet wood. Okay, it's even got authentic grass. You can see from the back, I've covered it with hessian sacking, an old piece of hessian sack we kept. Went into the woods, got hold of some bark. Done it all like this, little bark, making it look all authentic. And when he gets his coffee displayed up there, hopefully it'll sell a lot more and thank his old man for building it. Okay. I enjoy making things like this, people, as you know. And that would be handy as well. We can put that in the bushcraft camp and use that. One of the worst culprits is a wet landing net. Get it over there. Dip in a bucket of water or something. Sluice it all off. That one's got to be done. And then you'll be okay. I do a reasonable amount of fishing. You need to add sensual sandalwood and jasmine. Give it a blast of something perfumey, just to get rid of the smell of wet nets and bream slime. I'm not even altogether sure you can get rid of that bream slime smell ever. I've had many trips to Ireland with stinking keep nets. Oh, to be close as well. <laughs> that saves washing those. Money saved is money earned. Well, I love that money saved and money earned. Music to my ears. Anyway, that stand did do very well a few days ago from this film when I went up with Mike and Emmy to the bushcraft show. A bit of bushcraft stuff does get you relaxed, I have to say. And do you know what he had on it? Yes, he did indeed use it as his main coffee stand because Mike at Tea Outdoors now has his own brand of coffee he's marketing. I'm going to take a look at it, come and see what his stand looks like. Is that a couple, guys? <laughs> Emmy's in charge of the till, Mike's in charge of the management system here. <laughs> here we have a very nice table, built from pallet wood back at our house, with hessian and attractive bark, look I've done it here. That's his coffee stand, and you guys want some of Mike's coffee, you can get it, it's called Liquid Luna Colombian Coffee. Got his backpacks there, all made in England. New various release. other stuff. New yeah. release of the wallets. The oh, new wallet. release of a wallet. Oh my God. Oh, that's not big enough for me, that one. It hasn't got an elastic band. There's no band. Together. There's no band around that one, yeah. You're getting it as a birthday present, Graham. Yeah. yeah that was going to be. That's what's coming nice. this year. <laughs> oh, yeah, you're right. Want to take that one? Yeah, of course. Cash or card? Cash. <laughs> Emmy's using my favourite words. Yes, sir. Cash or card? Oh, I love it. I'd like to say thanks to all the people we met up at the Bushcraft Show and who took the trouble to come up and thank, well, both myself and Mike, mostly me because I make the better films, 
No, to thank both of us for making those films and taking the trouble to put them out there. We enjoy doing it. I would also like to thank the young man that bought me a bottle of Hobgoblin Ruby. You don't have to do that. I know a lot of you guys love watching our show, but you don't need to do that. But thanks anyway. It's probably gone before I even got home, to be honest. If I haven't got it, Mike's had it. Also, to the man who generously donated what must have been 10 years of savings of £5 notes and £1 coins because Mike was so busy after day one. We had, and I was on the stand with him, no change. Well, one man came up when I was minding the stall. I said, is there any way you've got any change at all? Oh my God, he must have rubbed the bank. Thanks for that guy. You got us out of trouble big time. Anyway, we're going to keep making those films. I know you guys love them, but listen, just put in the comments page because I quite like mixing films up and putting different stuff on, you know. We put a, a blacksmithing at night, we put the mead wine place uh, up. Uh, what else do we do? Oh, Sarah with that prehistoric cave. When I talk to the bushcraft people up there, they don't even know it's on there. They, don't, they haven't seen them and it's their type of show. So let us know if you like me mixing it up, something a bit different. Look, <laughs> I realise Friday is fishing, but I'm going to try and mix it up a bit. My problem is, I get bored, you know I get bored so quickly. Anyway, we'll see you next time. Oh, and yes, try something different. I normally have said for the last 10 years, hit the subscribe button, hit the notification bell, both channels. Just try hitting the like button. I don't normally go around begging for that one, but if you, if, if you want to give it a try, try it. We'll just see if it makes any change to the demographics. Also got, guys, a new picture up here. Mike was going to throw it out. I said, no, 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 let's put it in the fishing office. So we got it next to the shark. Do, 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 do. Okay, I'm going to get back to editing. You think I'm not editing it? Actually, you think I'm making this up, don't you? No. That's when I used to do all black and white. My own black and white had my own dark room years ago. There is indeed the edit facility which I am currently working on. And that is the time in the morning. And trust me, I finish later than that at night. I always have a break in between. So we'll see you next time. Thanks for watching the TA Fishing Show and TA Outdoors. Don't forget, you can always check Mike's website and see what's cooking over there. See you next time, guys.